Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Talk Scottish Football. We've made it to number 20. It's episode 20, David. We've, we've done well. We've managed to get this far and uh, it's another special edition of the podcast. It's nice to have you here, David. How are you doing, son? I'm good. I'm good. I'm delighted to have a very special guest, um, Tam Cowan. So obviously we're in the prestigious slot of your Saturday. We're in the Motherwell spot. So, um, you know, delighted to be able to share your, share your time with us. So just... Um, That's good. How, how are you, Tam? How have you enjoyed lockdown? I see you've been wearing that hat a lot on your Instagram, so I think uh, you'll, be, you'll be visiting the barbers when they open again. I've got uh, I've got three hats that uh, are kind of circulate, kind of like uh, squad rotation, because you can't <laughs> be seen to wear the you can't be seen to wear the same stuff all the time. Because I've already had folk pick me up, think there was some sort of tramp who'd been wearing the same dressing gown <laughs> and not even the same as but. I'm one of these people, if you remember the famous Michael Jackson uh, documentary, um, when he, he, he was going in the stores and whether he was buying gold ornaments or whatever, he was just walking in shops and saying, I'll have three of those, I'll have four of those, in that you like to vote in quantity. And I'm a bit like that, whether it's shirts, pants, socks, jeans, uh, or indeed pyjamas or dressing gowns. If I try something on, and Marks and Spencers or whatever it might be, and it fits me, and I like it, I just buy two or three of them. So I can assure them that it was having a pop at me, that all my clothes uh, were fresh. And just go for a bit of mystique. If you ever see any Instagram stuff, when, I, when I'm wearing my goonie, I uh, go commando beneath. So there's one for the ladies. That's the right way to do it. That's the right way to do it. There's no other way, Tam. No other way. Absolutely. Uh, so, I so lockdown's been fine. Uh, having a bit of fun, the old uh, the Instagram stuff. I, I, I like to spend a bit of time in it. If you're doing a, a song or something and you're trying to come up with the lyrics, uh, the wee parodies of songs. And because it is a race against the clock, because uh, a couple that I've done this week about uh, with Dominic Cummings being the, the central theme, you had to get them out nice and quick. There was no use putting a song about Dominic Cummins out next week. You know, it had to be out quite sharp um, or else it's spoiled because, as you know yourself, I've got this theory, I was saying it to uh, Stuart uh, when I was talking to him before our show at lunchtime, you can always tell the age of people who text you memes on the phone. You can always tell who are the old guy. <laughs> they, tend to, they tend to send you the ones that you had sent to you. What fucking two weeks ago, you know? <laughs> I had, there's a, an old pal of mine, he's a retired lawyer, he's in his 70s, and he sent me what in his mind was a funny meme. And it was one about Catherine Calderwood. <laughs> you're, you're even struggling to remember now who she is. That <laughs> <laughs> must be, what, seven weeks ago? Oh, I was ready uh, to start that. News. So, um, so again, when you try to put up your stuff um, on Instagram, and, and I tend to... I did a thing with Kay Adams on Sunday morning and uh, Radio Scotland where I, 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 I did a quiz slot for her on her programme. Now that involves me going on live on air at 10 in the morning and giving the first clue in this sporting quiz. And then it involves me going back on air at about 5 to 12, just before the end, to do the reveal, give the answer. So I now take it upon myself and, you know, hey, Lennon and McCartney would have struggled to do this. I take it upon myself to write a song uh, between 10 o'clock and 5 to 12, um, which is pretty pretty tough, but I've done it. I've done it so far every week. Um, just on your, your songs there, I've had Leech, He's a Star, stuck in my head for about a week now. So I'm, I'm yeah, you're the right age for that, just about. Uh, <laughs> oh, so S Club, fantastic stuff. Yeah, I mean, S Club 7, or, when, when did they peak? The early 2000s? Oh, early 2000s, it, I mean, I must have been. Was it, you know? But when I kept, I was actually... It, it, it sounds bizarre, but even though I'd already done umpteen songs by then, that one had been in my head the minute we started getting Professor Leach on the show. And, I mean, because we had him on for week one, and he's been on every week since, and to the point that we always, I mean, I think he, he slightly kicks himself for us as well, because the first week that we had him in, we were still able to have him in the studio. And that was indeed the last week that we had him in the studio in person. And when he came in that day, he immediately shook uh, me and Stuart by the hand, and we thought, wow. And when the show started, we says, Jason, before we get any further, um, he went against government advice, and he shook our hands, and he said, no, no, no. He said, I made the judgment call, judgment call, that you and Stuart had been washing your hands. I've certainly been washing mine, so it was safe. 
to wash your hands. And then he proceeded to tell us that that night, him and his wife were going out for a restaurant meal in Glasgow, and we were aghast. And we says, hang on, can you go to a restaurant? Yep, yep. Before I get into the restaurant, I will wash my hands and I'll use uh, sanitizer, hand gel. And then he says, when I'm in the restaurant, I'll go and wash my hands in the toilets. And then before we leave the restaurant, hand gel again. And he says, it's fine. But it just shows you how this thing has escalated because precisely one week later, not only were we unable to have him in the studio, he was he was down the phone and he's he's been down the phone since then, but he'd completely uh, changed his tune about so many things. You know, he says, well, tonight I certainly can't go to a restaurant. Uh, I would not, if I could have come into the studio, I wouldn't have uh, shook your hands this time. And it was bizarre. And it just, I mean, even he is the as the scientist, as the, the the medical officer or the virologist or whatever you want to call him, or the what's the fancy word beginning with E? Exactly. Well, even allowing for all the letters that he's got after his name and stuff, then he himself, he he's learning. You know, right. it, these are unprecedented times, and it'd have been the same with any. Uh, pandemic in the way back, even the Black Plague or something, way back when they've been the, the scientists of the day would have been learning as they go on. So it's been fascinating, but it, it, it's bizarre that what we pick up, that I now read out listeners' emails, some of which are absolutely fascinating, really, really interesting. But in terms of it being incredible what you pick up, we was having him on the show every week, I start reading email with somebody asking a question, or can I do this, or can I do that? And I already know the answer. Just because mm-hmm. for what I've picked up, and I say, oh, Jason, I hate having to ask you one of these, because he genuinely hates if we say, oh, a new, but there was one on today, a newborn grandchild. Uh, mm-hmm. our, 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 his granddad's dying for a cuddle. And I knew right away when I'm asking it, Jason's just going to say, no, I'm really, really sorry, but no, you can't do it, you know? And then we had this amazing thing today, which really, uh, really caught light on the show when we're asking them about now that we're allowed in the back garden of one other family or one other pal the whole thing about the barbecue and all that, uh, about no being able to get in the house to do the toilet and not even being able to have as, as, as coarse as that, no being able to have a bucket out in the back garden and even if you've gone the maximum five mile distance to travel to one of your friend's houses then his advice was you need to get back in the car and go back to your own toilet five miles back down the road for yourself or your kid. And that's a hard bit, the kid who, you know, I mean, I've got a wee girl and uh, when when they need to pee, they need to pee, you know. And you think, How, how's that workable? But the whole thing's utterly, utterly fascinating. I think, I think we'll all be uh, well-versed in this by the end. We'll all be kind of many virology experts, you know, it's just, it's brilliant, but he's been a great guest. But as I was saying to Stuart, the old classic uh, phrase uh, about fil- uh, familiarity breeds contempt, it's absolutely true, because incredibly, we're now starting to get some emails in to folk having a go at them, uh, which is incredible. It's just because they think, right, who is this guy? This guy's a dentist. What's he even telling us about? And the guy's been magnificent, because the vast majority of folk have, have understood the fact that a, a, a lot of these experts, particularly in the, the world of science, that you get popping up in the telly and that, they speak gobbledygook, and it's very, very hard to understand them. But he, for the outset, has spoken clearly, concisely, um, and, and in a way that a five-year-old kid can understand him. So I, I think he's been absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I'm glad you've covered him, Tom, because that was one of the few guys I wanted to ask you about. But this period as well, you've said it's been a bit surreal, a bit strange. It kind of just shows the sort of adaptability of the, of off the ball. You know, it's a, mainly a football show, but the fact that you've been able to, without any football, still keep a show that's engaged the listeners has been okay. fantastic. I mean, we, we, you know, we kid ourselves on sometimes. Me and Stuart, I, I, I've got the greatest respect, for example, with the young guys that do the, the View for the Terrace programme, right? Mm-hmm. But they guys can uh, lapse into, uh, with, with, with expertly, they can lapse into talking for 10 minutes about East Fife's diamond formation in midfield, right? <laughs> and that's great, but A, that sort of side of football has never really interested me. Even mm-hmm. when I look at the Motherwell team, that, that, that still doesn't really bother me. And I hate hearing them day maybe talking about tactics a bit too much. They guys do it brilliantly, and I doff my cap to them. 
But we've always looked elsewhere for subject material, and the, 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 the slightly kind of wank bag way I would describe it, I it's very tongue-in-cheek, as I always say, that football, football is merely the can which we paint, <laughs> and it, it, anything else, if it, it's something about the Montrose chairman breaking his leg because they fell off his bike that week, <laughs> then we would use that, we'd say the Montrose chairman this week, da, 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 the accident you've had when you've been outside your house or falling off a ladder or whatever, we would sooner go down that road rather than be try to be too too anarchy about uh, about football, you know. So it's been I must be honest, it's been it's been it's been very easy for us still to do shows. The only thing we would have hated and I mean this most sincerely, because it's just me and Stuart, uh, and of course like, a couple of guests at lunchtime, one guest in the evening, uh, we have been able to socially distance. I'm I'm sitting in my car the now in the uh, the car park uh, the BBC and honestly, if you were here the new way, you, you, you could get in there. The BBC is empty on a Saturday. And it's actually always empty on a Saturday. So social distancing for us has been absolutely fine. And the two of us get into the studio and we're two metres apart. Actually, we're more than two metres apart. And we've got eye contact through the glass with our producer. And when the guest, the kind of out-and-out -out football guest who comes in today, the evening show, and it's normally a person who's no stranger to the BBC because what we've been doing, and you can understand why, just in terms of getting your own guys a gig, because look, the games have been off and all the sports sound programmes uh, have been kind of abridged. Uh, we've had a lot of the guys that you would normally hear on sports sound to be our evening guests, you know. So we bring them in. But what we even do with that, we set the Saturday evening guest into another studio so that we can clearly hear them clear as a bell through the headphones, but we can get eye contact with them as well through the glass. Sadly, when they come in, as usual, you can't embrace them, you can't shake their hand, hiya, how are you doing? And when they go away at the end, you can't write, all the best, enjoy yourself a night, go for a pint, all that sort of stuff has uh, vanished. But, so it's been, the, the setup of the shows has been relatively easy for us. The content, because there's always content there, um, you know, if I use today as an example, our team of the week was the Shaving Eleven, uh, guys like Nick Dazovich and Razor Ruddock, simply because the guy Gillette uh, was uh, linked with Bayern Hart. So there's a story, it's a football story primarily, that immediately gives us a team of the week. Um, in the week of Dominic Cummings uh, going for his eye test to Bernard Castle, that gave us two things. We just did uh, opticians, jokes which we get loads sent in for the listeners. And we said, right, we always like a one-word topic the show. We said, our one-word topic this week is castle. And loads of folks sent in stuff about that. So we, we, we don't need, and in a, in a bizarre way, the fit was almost a distraction. You know, we could, if for some bizarre reason, uh, lockdown continued, Scottish football wasn't seen again for another two years, then I guarantee you that we'll still be on air for four hours um, every Saturday. There's still the club statements and stuff to divulge. There's an ongoing soap opera at Scottish football. Um, just kind of, obviously everyone's well known, you're a Motherwell fan, they've had a fantastic season. I know, Ryan, you've been impressed with Motherwell last season. Very, I mean, I mean, as a, a Celtic fan, it's always, you know, I'm on the I'm on the side of, me and David always have the argument, you know, he's a Dunfermline fan, I'm a Celtic fan, he thinks I look at the game very differently from the kind of high horse that it would seem the old fun fans looked at it from. But as a, as a Motherwell fan, this season must be, in terms of just going to the games and watching them, you must be really proud of everything that Stephen Robinson and Motherwell have achieved this season, Sam. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, first up, that's uh, an asterisk going against this podcast. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but as, uh, no, as, as I say as well on that note, I'll tell you, uh, I always like winding my, my, my to support Rangers. You know, the bottom line is, if I insist upon it, if Rangers are wanting a, a, an asterisk next to Celtic's name, then Motherwell fans want an asterisk next to Rangers because we could have still caught them in the know. games. It's yeah. highly, highly unlikely, uh, but it's just as unlikely Rangers catching Celtic. So, yeah, uh, we'll have an asterisk next to Rangers as well, please. Because <laughs> Motherwell had a great season. And I even get a lot of flack for some folk. Uh, at the time, Motherwell, when the leagues were called, Motherwell confirmed this third and Motherwell put out a kind of celebratory uh, video as I'm entitled today with the, the brilliant media team that we've got at Fur Park. The young guys there are some astonishing stuff that they produce. Mm -hmm. And I did a wee couple of songs, one in particular to celebrate finishing third. 
Yeah. And I get a fair bit of flack for Rangers fans. We, 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 you celebrating and all the rest of it, you know. And and I thought, why? Wait a minute, guys. I says we are third. A, a team like Motherwell, three thousand season ticket holders. We've got absolutely no right to finish third. And even if the leagues had continued and Aberdeen had picked us for third and we'd have been fourth, I would have been celebrating as well. So it wasn't a matter of celebrating, uh, you know, uh, that because we were handed something on a plate. The very least we were going to be was fourth. And I would still have been doing handstands. And some Rangers fans were saying, I mean, some, some of the stuff was poisonous, of course, but they're on about, what a redneck celebrating that. And I think, whoa, 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 guys. You were doing cap wheels when you won the third division. <laughs> you know, you were, you were, you were, you were, you were, you were the, 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 you know, the, the, the conga line uh, when, when you won the Petrofac Cup final. Uh, calm down. I think, I think we can support uh, finishing third. So that was a nonsense. But we've been great, and I, I, I really thought we knew to, to part answer your question as well. I, I'm really stunned that I can still call Stevie Robinson the motherwell manager because. Yep. The, the, the two gigs that came up in quick succession, both in Edinburgh, Hearts and Hibs, I thought, well, if he doesn't get one of these, he's going to get the other one. So when he didn't get the Hibs job and he did it to Jack Ross, I thought, oh, when the, when the Hearts job came up, I thought, well, he should be in this time. I'm oh, sorry, I, might, I think I get in the, uh, the Lang Light Run. It doesn't matter. But the, when the two gigs came up, I thought he was uh, guaranteed to get one of them. Um, and then that's why, when I know it hasn't been uh, announced yet, Unless you can bring me right up to date, but the Northern Ireland job uh, apparently is now Bookie's favourite. It would seem you wouldn't be too much of a cynic to suggest that Tommy Wright's going to get that, and that's what the uh-huh. whole leaving St Johnston was about. But if Stephen Robinson went tomorrow to the Northern Ireland job, A, he would go with the Motherwell fans' best wishes, and B, we, and I, I can only speak for myself, of course, I, I would have great pride as a Motherwell fan that an international team came and took our manager. Uh, you know, what a feather and our cap that would be in terms of how well we had done. So I, I, I really wish Stevie Robinson well. The, the one that I felt sorry for, I was in a laugh with him this week about it, is Keith Lasley, because there was a, an article earlier this week in the papers with Stevie Robinson uh, tipping uh, Keith Lasley to be his successor at Motherwell. And I text it, Keith, and I says, listen, before you start your head swelling and all that, I says, what that really means is uh, Stevie Robinson is tipping Keith Lasley, no, he is number two when he goes to the Northern <laughs> Ireland. He's, he's clearly looking for somebody bigger and better and think of the money you'd miss out in that uh, because the money, that's the other thing with Stevie Robinson, why he'd go with my best wishes. He's, he's relatively speaking on peanuts at Motherwell, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, even, I know Northern Ireland is not the biggest footballing nation on the planet, but they pay a fortune compared to Motherwell. And, you know, Stephen Robinson, family, you know, he's got family, he's got kids. And that's what we're all trying to do, uh, particularly in these times. Earn a few shekels for your nearest and dearest. So um, I would be astonished if he got offered that, if he didn't get offered it, rather. But, but my opinion on it is, I don't think he'll take it. Now, I would urge him to then really, you know, not quite pin the chairman against the wall, but I'd urge him if he didn't take it to say, right, I want to stay with Motherwell, um, but, you know, guys, there's a big gulf in what the wages could have been here for me, so are you going to up my money? And the reason I think he'll stay, just looking at his whole demeanour, I mean, the pair of you there, you've heard them in the, the post-match interviews when he's like a wee buzz bomb, talks non-stop, dead enthusiastic, even after a defeat, and I don't think, it's the, it's a bit of a cliche now, but I don't think he would necessarily enjoy uh, the international setup where you're not in training every day, you're not getting the players in the dressing room every day, you've maybe only got a game, you know, once every, whatever it might be, eight weeks, you know. Um, I think he's your classic example of a manager who really, really relishes the day-to-day involvement of uh, league football. So... Uh, I think it's a great accolade that he's been quoted, uh, and particularly after the season that we've had. And bear in mind, it wasn't that long ago. You know, almost the holy Scottish football had us doing his hammer throwers and a, a team of thugs and all that. Um, and he's really, really transformed our, our playing style. And lo and behold, it's worked a treat. We, we, we did finish third. It's official. We're third and we're into uh, Europe again. Now, we don't know when that's going to be. And I must be honest, in terms of the coronavirus, you're immediately, when your team's in Europe, you're thinking glamour and you want a wee bit of 
a great trip and all that, but even because of the situation with flights and stuff like that, I right the now, we played one athlete of Wales uh, a few years ago under Jim Gannon. Uh, I would take that again, just so that you could get down in your car, you know, or a series of cars with you and your pals if you can't sit together. Mm-hmm. Um, and we could go to Wales and go and see the game at a safe distance or whatever, uh, rather than thinking of getting onto a plane and as we did in that run of European uh, qualifications that we had, instead of going to flying into Iceland or uh, where else did we go? Denmark, Spain, uh, all these sort of places. So, yeah, I would take it. Whenever it does uh, come back, the European football, a wee car trip down to Wales would be absolutely ideal. No, I think you're dead on. You know, I, 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 we went to, of course, we played Lats, we went to Rome, and we we drove down to London Airport, and honestly, like London Stansted, and it was just, that alone, it's a great experience, but everything you're saying about Robinson, I completely agree. I've always been a great admirer of the way he speaks. I think he, he's always, he tells how it is. He's one of the managers, you know, he doesn't Aye. hide anything. He always says how it is. If you were to even take off your, you know, your tinted glasses or whatever, do you think he's manager of the year this year? Would you give him the award if you were one of the people who made the decision? Um... Well, I'm a firm believer, and historically what happens, it tends to be the majority of the times, of course, the manager uh, who wins the league, who wins the the top flight title in Scotland, Mm -hmm. uh, can get the manager of the year. But I I always like the pound for pound argument, and I think because the word is in there somewhere, manage, that's the key word if you're a manager, you've got to manage, right? They were the best will in the world, Brendan Rodgers, I thought, was a brilliant. Uh, manager for Celtic and a great tactician, but you know he didn't really have to manage Celtic when he had uh, all the money he spent. You know, uh, and certainly uh, compared to all the other clubs, but he had his disposal in the club coffers. So absolutely, this year as you get doing the league, uh, you would need to say Stevie Robinson's right up there. Be very magnanimous here, and I'd, I'd, I'll leave Stevie out of it because I'm a Motherwell fan. It's too easy. And I'd say if you're talking about manager, a manager who manages uh, with the resources at his disposal, then you need to mention Gary Holt as well. Uh, you know, absolutely for me. And then you even look at, you know, somebody like Dick Campbell uh, keeping a part-time team like our growth um, in the championship. What an absolutely brilliant achievement. So I always tend to look that way. But sometimes when it happens, you get a lot of flack. I think it was big Yogi Hughes. Uh, when he got manager uh, in the year a few years ago, for it must have been when um, Inverness, Inverness uh, uh, the years Inverness beat uh, Falkirk, maybe in the Scottish Cup five years ago now. But there was a lot of folks, you know, how can the manager of the year be, you know, are we doing that, end of football and blah, 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 you know. But I thought it was uh, perfectly justified, you know. But, but the, the crazy thing with that is I just wish that when it came to manager of the year or uh, player of the year at your club, or even goal of the season, they would wait until the season or the year, whatever you want to call it, is actually finished. Because uh-huh. the amount of times, it even happens sometimes in live telegrams. It was a famous one years ago. I think it was Sandy Clark and Rob McLean in the commentary box. And uh, I'm trying to think who it was. It was an Edinburgh Derby. But Hibs were coasting it 4-2 uh, four, four or something, and Hearts came back to four each. And I think it was big uh, um, uh, Mark De Vries was out and they might have scored two late goals. It was something like that. I might be getting the detail wrong here. But he was clearly the candidate for Man of the Match. It was Roy the Rovers stuff. In fact, mm-hmm. it might have been me, Graham Weir. But it was a right Roy the Rovers tale. But Sandy Clark had already, in something like the 78 minute, he was asked far too early to Rob. He'd, he'd announced his Man of the Match. And I thought, oh, go away. How can you do that, you know? And the thing mm-hmm. is as well, in terms of player of the year, let me use Motherwell as an example. Let's say the year that Motherwell did win the Cup. I'm contractually obliged in anything that I appear on to <laughs> mention Motherwell won the Cup, right? But, but in, in, this, in this case, it's relevant. In the year that we won the Cup, clearly the highlight of that season was May the 18th winning the Cup, right? Now, I can guarantee you that all the Player of the Year awards, the official clubs won and all the supporters' bashes would have been held before the final because after the final, everybody was gone on holiday, the players wouldn't have been at the events, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know who it was that year. Maybe it was Luke Nyholt. Maybe it was Ali Maxwell. Maybe it was Davy Cooper. But if you would have had the Player of the Year event after that cup final, then quite frankly, there were only two contenders. It was either 
the ultimate match winner, Stevie Kirk, who scored the extra time winner and he'd scored in every round, or it was our hugely injured goalie, the absolute hero of the hour, Ali Maxwell. And it'd been one of them if we'd have waited until the season completed, who would have been player of the year. So that sort of stuff always, uh, I know I went off at a tangent here, but I always kind of fix in my crop. There's absolutely nothing worse, Tam, than when they hand out awards prematurely. It's just sickening. No matter if it's for teams or players. When they hand out awards prematurely, whether it's for teams or players, it's sickening. Aye, aye. I know. It's so, and you even get the... Again, the day, each, what I think, oh, the worst thing about any Man of the Match award, though, is when it's clearly... There's this sort of... I don't know why they do it, but the, the sponsors of a game that you're at, the sponsors, aye. despite the outcome of the game, they, they always give it to a home player. Mm. You know, like the wee plumbing for them. D.S. Allison, come <laughs> on. Uh, for Mary Street and Motherwell's man of the match is. And, you know, he, 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 he gives it, oh, Trevor Carson, the Motherwell goalie. When the, the same Motherwell goalie's maybe lost fucking seven goals. To <laughs> you know, but I, I've never, I, I think they should always be a bit more generous with that. And if somebody has come to Far Park, and absolutely rumped us, and one of the players has been the star man by a country mile, and I gave him the man in a match award. There was a famous one at Dunfermline a few years ago, I said, and Michael Moffat was given the man of the match award, but in the last five minutes he missed two penalties, and he had to have his <laughs> photo taken with this man of the match award, we'd gone to lose the game, and he was near enough in tears with the photo. There you go, arrest, yes, that's a great point, aye. It just makes me think of Livingston, they always do it, it's always a wee electrician or something and somebody's been getting man in the match and they've been hopeless the whole game and they've just been tanned, but I just one more thing before we move on to the next, because David wants to take it elsewhere, but um, you, you already warned us to ask specific questions, so I'll try and change it up a wee bit here about the, the show and that. As a Motherwell fan, do you think do you think off the ball would have seen as much success, say, and say you and Stuart, you're, you're known for being such big fans of Motherwell and St Johnson. If it wasn't like that, if you were Celtic Rangers fans, do you think it would have went the same way? Do you think that adds a lot of you know, attention to the show you could do? No, absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's about balance because neither is, because you can't get away with it. Look at even the allegations that I've made against pundits about them being either a Celtic or a Rangers fan, when they're actually no. Mm-hmm. But how things are sometimes perceived. I give you Chick Young, the classic example. <laughs> now, as I argue before, if Chick. You know, he threatened to retire three years ago now, and he never quite made it, right? But if Chick did eventually retire, uh, and you know, and it's in my prayers every single night before we go to bed, <laughs> if, Chick, if Chick actually did officially retire, I would I would bet my bottom dollar on the fact that he, he would go to see St Mirren on a Saturday when he's no working for the BBC and no dispatch to a game of the BBC's choosing. So, but we mean, Stu, the dynamic is based support that we did a team. Uh, with particularly in a national uh, radio station, I think was just about perfect. And I, I kind of sensed it was going to work because when I started it uh, with the, the Evening Times in Glasgow newspaper, when I started with them, 1991, um, just as a young lad, 20, 21 I would have been, um, when I started with them, that, that was a perfect pitch because I was a motherwell fan in what was predominantly a Glasgow paper, and back in the day, 1991, a huge readership. When uh, you know, seven years before Google, if you like, uh, the, the the newspapers uh, had a huge effort to bought a newspaper. So there was a lot of folk buying the, the Evening Times, and it was more or less a 50-50 split Celtic and Rangers fans. So the great thing for me, which uh, made it easier for me, going in there as a Motherwell fan. And been able to turn base barrels on Celtic one week, Rangers the next, you know, Rangers for two weeks, Celtic for three weeks. Depending, of course, which one of them did, uh, deserved a bit of a slagging for whatever they'd been up to or how heavily they'd been horsed in Europe or whatever. So that was kind of good. And that's what won me an audience. Uh, and I think most folk, most fair-minded folk would say that then I was fair with that. And it was clearly no inkling that I had any feelings whatsoever for Celtic or Rangers. Of course, nature of the beast any time. Back then in the paper, then moving on, Daily Record, Scottish Sun, whatever, and certainly we off the ball. If you kind of have a laugh or a joke at the expense of Celtic, then the Celtic fans immediately think, ah, Cowan, blue-nosed bastard, you know. <laughs> and then if you have a go at, if you have a go at Rangers, of course, 
Then the Rangers fans, aye, Cowan, might have known that, aye, fucking Celtic fan, ah, my arse, he's a Motherwell fan. And as long as, I keep saying to folks, as long as you keep mixing that up and you get accusations for both sides, then brilliant, absolutely brilliant. It, it, I think it, it maybe proves that you must be doing something right. Mm, I get that every time I try and keep him grounded, I'm a Ranger season title holder, so I know exactly what you're, what you're saying. Exactly. Um, yeah, just back on the show, you know, obviously when you've, you've got Motherwell at home, you can go and see Motherwell. You never get to see the full game, you've said that before on, on numerous places. No. Has there ever been a time in a journey back to the studio where the game's maybe been finally poised where you've just felt like chucking it? Oh, I, I, no, I never felt like chucking it, but, um, you know, the bottom line is I'm no, a, I'm no a fucking plumber or an electrician. This is actually my job, you know, so the very idea of chucking it would be crazy, but I don't say... What, see, there's a positive out of that as well, yeah. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't even start to list them, but hi, I mean, I, I traditionally uh, would leave for part when it's about, about 80, 81, 82 minutes on the scoreboard. I think, right, I better go, irrespective of the result. And half the battle with that was uh, getting getting back to the car, which used to be parked just up by Fur Park, in the car park they used for hospitality guests now. And when I uh, could first drive when I learned to drive 2012. I was a late developer with all driving. Um, it was the one thing I asked Motherwell for. I mean, I, I do all the, the Motherwell events now, and it's an absolute honour, and I enjoy myself at them. But you would never ever like, charge them or anything like that. I just wouldn't do it. But the one thing I did ask them for, one and only thing, was to get a shot of that uh, car park, because it was quite near the exit for the main stand, and it meant I wouldn't need to leave drastically early in order to get into the car, then drive back to Glasgow for our evening show. So that was great. But uh, I was, uh, oh, cunning like a fox uh, at the back earlier this season or last season or whatever the fuck you want to call it now. But um, uh, Leanne Hutchison, Les Hutchison's daughter, you mind Les, who had kind of uh, put a bit of money into Motherwell. Oh. When I used to always notice that Leanne's car, it kind of his daughter, Leanne, was on the board representing him. And Leanne had a parking space right outside the main stand. And I used to see it and think, God, that would be great to be able to park my motor there, like 15 yards for the gate that I came out, you know. So when Les Hutchison got his money back and they paid them off, Leanne, of course, left the board. And within half an hour of her leaving the club being announced, I got on to our chief executive, Alan Burroughs, and I says, listen, is there any chance I could snaffle her wee parking space? It would make such it would make such a difference to me. I could now maybe leave in the eighty sixth minute. That's like four extra minutes that I could see for maybe a penalty, a winning goal, a red card, something dramatic that I might miss. So they gave me it. So it's a, it's kinda officially now my parking space. Now I don't I say to them, listen, I'm no I'm not going to uh, muck you about with this. I says, it, I'm only asking for it on a Saturday, which is when we do the radio. If a game gets moved to a Sunday and I'm up at the game, I'll, I'll be there. I'll be able to mull on a taxi that so I can go for a pint with my pals. Ditto if it's a midweek game. I won't even have the car. I says, but if it's a Saturday, for the purposes of getting back into the radio in time, uh, nice and smart, can I have that space? And I'm, I'm delighted that they gave me it. Couldn't put a price on it. Um, it's a lot better than sprinting down Springfield Road and Todd Street to catch a 38 before the crowds pile oh, up. Oh, exactly. A lot better that. <laughs> Just moving on, Tam. Obviously, the, the, one of the main things about the Off the Ball show is the longevity. Obviously, had the 25-year celebrations last year. Do you think now, if the show was to start now, if you were to start this show now, do you think it would kick off the way it has done? Or is the fact that it's such a sort of... Um, it's been going for so long, keeps it popular now. Do you think if you'd started now, you'd have that same success? Um... It's a tough thing because um, it might not have had the same opportunity. I would like to think when we did start, in, uh, well, 1994, officially the programme started uh, when Greg Hempel of Still Game fame was the first host. And I was like a panellist on it with Sanjeev Kohli, who of course went on to Still Game fame as well. And then Stuart came in the year uh, after that. And then it's been the periods ever since. But in terms of it was easier for us, shall I say, to make an impact because there wasn't anything quite like it at the time. Um, and it always seemed that Sports Sound, which was on then on the Saturday, Sports Sound, and I'd, I'd even like to think off the ball could take a wee bit of credit for that. Sports Sound, if you heard an old edition of Sports Sound for the mid-90s, it would sound a lot stiffer than it does now. 
and a lot more formal. Whereas the guys on that, oh, they laugh a joke and I carry on as well. So when we first came on the airwaves, then I, 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 there's no doubt that off the ball, a lot of folks thought, wow, what the hell is this? It sounds so different. So I think for any guy starting now, and that's why I doff my cap to the view for the terrace boys, because um, I, I, I know for a fact that when, you know, there was a, 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 lot, of, uh, a lot of different, different ideas for a, a, a football uh, programme for the new channel. It wasn't as if they guys were the first offer. Uh, there was a lot of folk who had done pilot shows, but theirs was the one that was chosen. Now, the bottom line is me and Stuart didn't have that sort of competition. Simple as that. Uh, as far as kind of, I would still call your show a kind of a fanzine programme. And the fanzines at the time, pre-internet, were strictly the, the hard copy ones that you bought probably instead yeah, the, the boring match programme outside uh, the stadium that you were walking up to. So when we were able to kind of transfer that sort of chat, that sort of humour onto the airwaves, it, it did make us stand out for the other programmes that were on air at the time. So that, that was a good thing. So I, I definitely think to answer your question, um, it would be a lot harder uh, starting out now. You think, right, what really makes us sound different? But the great thing that always, I, I, I'd never be one for blowing main trumpet, I'm quite the opposite in fact, but the two things that I really like in terms of longevity of uh, off the ball is that we've brought a lot of the audience with us, it, it, it could almost have the tears streaming down my face, we regularly get emails from folk who say that somebody's in the car with a wee boy going to the game, and when off the ball was starting out, they were the wee boy in the car with their dad going to the game, and they've listened to us all that time, and the other great thing is that you get, I've had so many females coming up to me in the street, in a restaurant, in the supermarket, and they all say the same line. They say, Tom, I don't like football, but I love listening to Off the Ball. And I always take that as a great tribute um, with folk that are no remotely interested in the game that we all adore, but they like listening to football. That goes back to the point I made about how me and Stuart are never too bogged down in the tactical analysis in the game. It's, it's no your cup of tea at all. And that's what allows you to draw in um, extra listeners and a, and a, a wide, wide demographic. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the two uh, facets of the show. Mm. Um, I think, Ryan, you wanted to cover some stuff, similar sort of theme to start out and stuff. Um, Obviously, I don't want to keep you all here all day, Tom. I say that to everybody. We know you're busy, busy people. Um, but there was uh, something I want to talk about. You, you kind of touched on it there when you started off. We were uh, talking to, man, you might be familiar with Mr. Hugh Evans a while ago. He was in uh, the college. We would say, had a conversation with him. And we were talking to him about it. We were talking you know to him about Do you know that Hugh Evans, Hugh Evans' first caller on the uh, Radio Clyde phone in was Alexander Graham Bell? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't shock me. That wouldn't shock me at all. Um, but he was telling us, you know, obviously when he started, it, you know how things. Um, he was kind of just thrown into the deep end. Like you can always come in, or you can write, you can do it. Now. It's obviously a lot different now for people like us. We need to go through, you know. Well, if you're good at your your, your job, you're going to find a way there. I think I'm firmly believing that if you work hard enough and you, you put your hard work effort in there, you'll do it. Uh, but he was saying I was kind of thrown at a deep end and how nowadays it would be difficult for him because, you know, the college work you go through, maybe having to go to university. Uh, I mean, the way your career has went, is there anything you would have done differently or is it just, is, is everything kind of panned out perfectly for you? Would you like to work in a kind of modern age with, you know, your YouTube side of things and stuff or has everything just been the way you kind of like it? Strange. I mean, when I, and it's sort of day with uh, the media at large and how different it is for Hugh Keevans here, if you like, because when I finished up last June with the Scottish Sun, uh, that was after 29 years in newspapers, even in Times, Daily Record, Scottish Sun. And basically, as a columnist, um, I became an expendable luxury because uh, print uh, newspapers are having an absolutely horrific time of it, and more so now during the, the lockdown period when folk just weren't getting into shops and stuff like that and weren't they picking up a newspaper wasn't a necessity and of course as you boys know I'm, I'm guessing that neither of the two of you will regularly buy a print newspaper it's all online you know and you Aye. get the websites there so I if you like and others many others uh, a lot of good people uh, would have been a casualty there but in terms of moving with the times 
Uh, almost immediately after I finished up with the Scottish Sun last summer, I went on holiday right away, and uh, it was great in Scotland, and particularly the, the uh, Scotland's kind of media hub. It's, it's, it's very, very small. Everybody knows everybody. So the word quickly got out that I had uh, finished up with the Scottish Sun, and I, I cut the uh, editors, including a couple of my former editors, saying, oh, you yeah, know, we might m maybe have a wee opening here and all the rest of it. But as it turns out, and it was basically just, again, down to their finances, their budgets, nothing did happen with that, right? It was, they, they, they didn't have a pot to pass in, so they couldn't start throwing money at me. But I, I kind of, which is they like me, because for a, a long number of years in my life, I had undoubtedly been a bit of a technophobe. I had a, a Nokia 3310 phone until May 2016, and I bought it as a phone. That is a serious, I bought it as a phone it's, it's for you. Like, it sounds like some old duffer sitting down the stairs to me. He, he was the exact same. He done it. Well, I, I think that would be a, a defensive well, weapon at a football match now. <laughs> Aye, but I got that in 1998. I had it for 18 years. Um, and latterly, the, the wee button that put it on and off at the top, I'd, I'd lost that. And if heaven forfend, the battery ever completely died. I, I was always kept in my toes with having no on and off button. I always had to make sure it was charged. And then one day, I looked at it and it was deed. I'd forgot to switch it on at the wall. And what I ended up doing, and I did it thereafter, and this is bonkers, really, I'm just moving to the modern times and got a new phone. I started then, the only way I could switch the phone on was to unfurl a paper clip and put it in, stick it in the top of the phone and try to make the wee connection. And I, see the first time I did it and the phone lit up, oh! <laughs> oh, it was like one in the lottery, right? I was delighted, but it was getting utterly farcical. And I ended up latterly holding the phone together because it was going up. It wasn't catching, the wee catch at the back, it wasn't, and the back would fall off it. So I, I had it held together with one of my wee lassie's hair clips <laughs> run the tap of the phone. And ended up calling my phone Rambo. That was its pet name. Because <laughs> the wee headband run the tap. But it was, it was a joke. But I, I then did get, um, moved into the iPhone generation stuff. And what I was going to say with that was, when, in terms of how you, you, we all have to just kind of try and grasp technology. Um, when I was on my holidays, uh, after leaving the Scottish Sun, uh, Peter Martin, uh, who does PLZ soccer, uh, him and Big Alan Ruff, Peter got on to me, seeing if I fancied doing some work uh, for him. And uh, I thought, aye, now all his stuff is all done in uh, YouTube, Facebook Live, and podcasts that are put out in the usual places for podcasts. And uh, and I thought, well, you know what? I, I, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't as if Peter was offering me the world and uh, great money or anything like that. Uh, but I thought, aye, why not? That's another string to my bow. Um, and I'd go at that, and it meant I could dip my toe into all that side of things. And, and where I've impressed myself with that recently is that, uh, of course, in lockdown, we're no longer doing all the stuff with Peter in the PLZ studios there in Bells Hill at the Strathclyde Business Park. We're, we're doing them from home. And just a couple of years ago, I would never have guessed that I would have had the wherewithal to sit in my house, setting up an iPad, and been able to, do, uh, uh, to broadcast a sports programme via that medium. And I certainly wouldn't have guessed, because I only went on it last, uh, nearly a year now, just it was the, the day that we were going on holiday last July, the start of July, I think the 3rd of July, we were going to Florida, was the day that my wife finally convinced me to get involved with social media. And uh, so I joined Instagram that day. I'm nearly up to my first anniversary. And my first post on Instagram was a classic cliche post where we were sitting on the plane, looking out the plane one day, and it was pushing down. <laughs> and it was, take a guess, am I still in Glasgow or have we arrived in Florida? <laughs> and that was my first post. That since then, I, I pat myself on the back when I look at some of the stuff I've, uh, I've been able to do on Instagram with the songs and the storyboards and a bit of content and all that. And I'm, I'm delighted that folk have, have kind of taken to it because only meant to do it for the three weeks that we were on holiday in Florida because I always kept, for my wee girl, for the first holiday we took her on, I always kept a diary of everything that we did every day so that I could show it to her when she was older. My dad did that with me. So it's just something that kind of passed through the generations. 
And my wife says, right, Instagram, because she knew I was terrified of Twitter and with all the trolling it goes on. And she knows that even though I might sound a wee bit mouthy on the radio or whatever, she knows that I'm actually, which I'm quite uh, very, very thin skinned, in fact, that she knew that I wouldn't be able to handle uh, Twitter. So she says, Instagram. Instagram, almost as a rule, is very nice. The folk are lovely to each other. So why don't mm. you try that? So I says, right, I'll give it a go for the Florida Diaries. That's what I think I called. That's how I started all those posts. I says, the Florida Diaries, day one, day two, day three, whatever, putting up photos and that. And it was at the end of it, and I let, I let the punters decide. I says, right, that was actually quite good fun. I says, but I did. I was going to call a halt to it at the end of my Florida holiday. But the, the followers that I'd built up with it, quite a few, quite rapidly, uh, they all said, no, no, keep it going, Tom, and uh, see what you can add to it now you're, when you're known Florida and your back came and we want to see behind the scenes off the ball and we want to see what happens when you're out and about or when you're at a Motherwell game or when you any famous folk that you have in your shows or blah 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 so I kept it going and that was that and I, and I must admit I've, I've, I've quite a lot of fun with it and what I've been able to do as well I'm not looking for an MBE or an OBE or then but I, I, I'm involved with a few charities and through that I've been able to do a lot of stuff for them and get a, a, a wide range of businesses and restaurants and bars and t-shirt suppliers, butchers, all sorts of folk to put up uh, prizes for deserving causes, which the, the, the folk have reacted to really well um, on Instagram. So that, that's been good as well. And I, I can't tell a lie as well. If I get, if I get down to the absolute crux of the matter, um, Pre, particularly that's how I, I really went for it during lockdown. I say, as I speak, although it's been eased, that's been 66 days, I think it was. And the reason I really went for it as well is that my weekends were wiped out a big chunk in my life, a big chunk in my career, a big chunk in my earnings. Normally, Friday, Saturday, uh, to a slightly lesser extent, a Sunday, I would be out in some shape or form in front of a live audience. I'd either uh, be, be doing an after-dinner speaking gig, I'd be hosting a charity event, I'd be hosting an awards night, I'd be doing a night, a Q&A night for Motherwell. And anybody who does anything like that with a microphone in their hand, they'd be lying if they tried to tell you they didn't enjoy the buzz of getting a laugh in front of a live audience. So I think a psychologist wouldn't need to scrape too far beneath the surface of my brain to say that maybe the real reason I enjoy Instagram is because you've got an audience out there and you get a reaction mm -hmm. and you get Aye. a wee buzz out of that. Uh, so that really might be one of the reasons that I, I, I kind of took to it and I'll, I'll stick by it now. And why I'm embarrassed it, Matt, what, I think it was last Tuesday there was the worst one yet. And you know how you get the wee notification, I think, weekly in your phone. Aye. Your screen time. Uh -huh. Oh, for fuck's sake! <laughs> no. I couldn't even say it. I couldn't even say it in my life. Now, once upon a time, I know you're a panic because it'd have been porn. But <laughs> I think ever since I started on Instagram, who who gives a shit about porn? Bloody rubbish, you know. Straight on to Instagram, please. But I, I get I get the notification last week, and it said that uh, your screen time over the week will average blah blah blah, an average of nine hours 45 minutes a day a day and I, that's rookie number for that stuff. I know i know that must be rookie stuff compared to what david's racking up here there he's oh. statement. but uh, I, I mean it actually but we have as i can clearly tell we have as all porn <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, wow. If I was one of the police identica artists that made the drawings in the court, and I was asked to draw, to draw a portrait of a guy who watches porn 24-7, there's the face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh God, I hope my grand's not going to be watching this. I know, you've been talking about how his dad and his granddad are going to die to watch this, and now you've said that. Be, <laughs> um, but I've got... already watched it as well. <laughs> <laughs> I actually yeah, something. Yeah, you ask the grandparents that they've been the K's uh, Christmas catalogue for them that they used to get and looking about eight, a good solid eight pages a middle-aged woman posing in pantyhose and girdles. <laughs> uh, they, 
that was your Scud book back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it links up really nicely with the last couple of things we wanted to touch on before we wrap it up. You, you touched really briefly on the PLZ with Peter Martin. I, I, I've worked with Peter before doing a video with him. It was a fantastic setup. I was, I was like, boy, I was right. the stuff that was there. But um, it's one of those things. Have you ever sat down and, and thought to yourself, you would like to give something like that a go, like start your own regular podcast, get something going, maybe more like a, maybe a Spotify or Apple market or anything like that? Uh, aye, and uh, I want to suggest that. I mean, again, another thing that uh, I, I, I still miss uh, with Scotland, with the newspapers, is that for the, the last 20 years in newspapers, uh, I was reviewing restaurants, which was the best job in the world, right? So there was a lot of folk then when I started getting involved in social media, saying, oh, you should do a blog uh, or whatever about uh, restaurants and day one restaurant. I mean, that's something that I might do, but to be honest with you, obviously no, no, but the... For, for, I've, I've done almost reviews of uh, recently, takeaway stuff and stuff that are starting today, delivery services and that, and I like still writing wee bits and pieces about food, but uh, let's say when the world is back to normal, then I will have a pretty busy week doing what I do already, and even just now in lockdown, I mean, I, I do a lot of prep for off the ball on a Friday, gutting all the week's papers, did plenty of stuff that I've always done in the 25 year history of the show I've taken that upon myself to fill out the papers all week and come in armed with plenty of possible talking points for me and Stuart do that on a Friday and then normally when the world was normal I'd go at a gig somewhere up in could be anywhere Dundee, Aberdeen, down in Ayrshire or wherever, then again early doors Saturday, we'd do a two hour show at lunchtime an hour and a half at night, or two hours as the case may be now, under lockdown when sports sounds cut a wee bit short in a live football. And then I'd boot somewhere Saturday night. I'd normally boot somewhere a Sunday afternoon. And then as I'm doing now, for Kay Adam show on a Monday, I do a wee uh, quiz slot with her on the Monday. And then my day uh, Peter Martin and the guys is uh, Thursday with PLZ. And that, I, that takes up my afternoon with Peter. So... I, I, I like keeping myself busy, but in terms of the a podcast, I mean, there is an argument, you know, it may harm to yourselves, boys, but you'll know this yourself, that you, you get a feeling that every man these dogs doing a podcast, oh, with, you know, and, oh. and the difficult thing, as you'll probably appreciate, is it's really, really tough to stand out for the crowd, and really, really hard to get yourself noticed, now it's easy if you're doing it, if you're somebody like, I'm trying to think of the big hitters, or Peter Crouch, or uh, you know, Gary Winnicar and Danny Baker. The, the one thing that I would say, and you know, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, call me an old cynic and somebody that's been at this game in the media for a long time now, but if I was doing a podcast, I would like to be doing it more than just for the fun of it, you know, uh, because that, that, that's what I do as my career, and that's what I've done for 25 years with the BBC, with radio and telly, so um, if, I, if somebody came along to me, a sponsor, for example, and says, Tom, we would love you today um, a, a, a restaurant review podcast. And it was somebody saying that, like, and commend it, Greg's, Iron Brew, Tunnocks, Tenants, somebody like that, a big hatter in Scotland, oh. says, we'll sponsor it. We put our name, because I've, I've clearly, I'm not bringing this stuff off the top of my head. I've clearly thought about it before, boys. Um, and then I, I would maybe go for that, but as things stand, we've got a wee idea with uh, my pal, who uh, I made all my telly programs with, we did offside in BBC One for uh, nine years. Uh, we've got a wee idea in just now, which is restaurant review related. Um, kind of, not quite, but the best way to explain it to you, if you think of a, a Scottish man versus food, uh, oh, yeah. that we've, got, we've got a wee idea in about that, which, because I, I don't want to waste the 21 year experience that I, I had of going into restaurants professionally on a weekly basis, I wouldn't want to just throw that away. So I'd quite like to do a wee spin off for the newspaper reviews and, and do something on the telly with it. But watch this space, as they say. Um, <laughs> brilliant. Just to segue back to something you said earlier about the after dinner stuff um, and the PLZ stuff, the podcast that you did with uh, Andy Cameron on PLZ. It was just gag central. I watched that last night. Is there a favourite sort of gag that maybe you tell an after dinner show or something you've heard over the years that still makes you tickle when you tell it? For me, like the one about the, the donkey playing for Juventus is just 
sensational. That, that one always well, gets the, me. Well, the one that, the, the, aye, the donkey, uh, the donkey uh, playing with your uh, joke. That was basically, that's a classic example of a joke that was sent in by a listener. Whatever the hell we were talking about that day, whether it was your favourite joke about animals or whether it was Juventus that get mentioned, I don't know what it was. Um, and I just read that out and then the, the technical wizards uh, and at the BBC, they were able to form that into a wee kind of something visual uh, to put up on Twitter and it absolutely went mental. And another classic joke, an old joke that again somebody reminded us of, I'm not, I'll tell you what, it was a time that we had Darren Jackson in and off the ball uh, last year sometime. And he had just started a, like a chauffeur, a limousine company, uh, Darren Jackson. And it reminded me of the joke, uh, and I made it Scottish. It was about the, uh, when the Pope was there in Glasgow, and uh, he's got the chauffeur driven about, and he taps in the glass, he says to the chauffeur, you know what? Um, I've been in the back of these motors for years. I've always fancied a shot at driving any chance. And the shoulder says, well, you're the boss, you know, so Pope jumps in the front seat and away he hails through Glasgow. But he's no used to driving, of course, so he, he, he breaks the speed limit and all the rest of it. Blue flashing light, full of stop him. He rolls down the front wind and the postman can't he believe it. Straight on to his superior. And he says, oh, you'll never guess who I've arrested here. I don't know what he did. I don't know what he did. He says, who is it? He says, oh, you, you'll never guess. He says, what is it? Stephen Gerrard, the Rangers man. He says, oh, much bigger than that. And he says, oh, is it Nicola Sturgeon? First Minister, he says, off, much bigger than that. He says, who is it? Who is it? He says, well, I've no idea who he is, but he's got the fucking Pope as his chauffeur. Only tell that joke, minus the F word, which I would usually tell it with the F word, then it kind of be a, a sweary and a joke. It really gives oh, it a punch. Yeah. But when I told that, I only told that joke because I've, I've got a heap full of fucking jokes. And only told it because Darren Jackson was only. Um, talking about being a chauffeur, and it was the one joke that sprung to mind. But the minute I told that, then again, the techie wizards at the BBC, they had kind of visualised it and put it on Twitter, and it went absolutely mental. So jokes like that are absolutely brilliant. And, um, you know, it's, it's um, as I say, I, I really miss being able in front of a live audience. I mean, we've got a, we're, we're blessed that we've got a really, really big audience for off the ball. But basically, the nearest we get to an audience is when we're allowed guests in the studio in the good old days, pre-virus, and we've got two guests sitting there. They're our audience, you know. Um, but in terms of a response to a joke, that's why if you're doing an after-dinner gig, if you're at an award ceremony, if you're hosting a do for Motherwell, whatever it might be, on stage with a mic, there's, you can't beat the buzz that you get for an audience laughing. It's brilliant. Yeah, I just that's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, Ryan, just a couple of things to finish. I we're, we're just going to kind of wrap it up now, Tom. Everything that you've said has been absolutely, you know, it's it's fantastic to come on. We say every guest we have. Um, there's one question that we always like to try and ask, although me, the, the fanny that I'm, I forgot to ask our last guest. Um, but the, what, since the show is called Talk Scottish Football, if you want to quickly summarise. What does Scottish football mean to you, Tom? What, what, how do you look at it? What is, how has it affected your life? I'll tell you what Scottish football means to me. I have, as I sit here just now, I've completely blanked the Bundesliga. I'm proud that I have not watched a single nanosecond of that <laughs> guff. <laughs> uh, folk have got their trumpets out, heralding the fact that the English Premier League starts back on Wednesday, June the 17th. I can safely say I will completely blank it. <laughs> Cannot stand the overrated English top flight. But, if as has been reported, although our good pal Professor Jason Leach doesn't think it's going to happen, but if Scottish football started back in August the 1st, and the only game it was starting back with that day was Brecon City against Annan Athletic, I would be all over it like a rash. And I would have a box of man-sized tissues at the side, because that would be football porn, in my opinion. So... Scottish football all the way. Any European stuff, I've said this numerous times, it's an off-the-ball trope. I'm only interested in European football when there's a Scottish team taking part. Uh, when there's no Scottish interest, there is no interest from me. And that includes Champions League finals. That includes everybody slavering about Barcelona and Lionel Messi. Yeah, they know how to play football. Yeah, he's a genius. But I can only take him now in small doses. 
you know, uh, give me Lionel Ainsworth. I had a Lionel Messi any day of the week. Fantastic. That, that couldn't be any more different from our last guest, Derek. I know, I was like, aye, of course. It was just so night and day there. You know, <laughs> one, one podcast heavily Bundesliga orientated and then buying that. But you know, I love Derek, and I know Derek, and we've had him in the show and stuff, and Derek's one of these guys who, as a, as a kid, I'm sure Derek is one of these who was uh, recording kind of imaginary commentaries into his tape recorder. And I think Derek might even have sent some of them to the late great Bob Crampsey um, when he was a boy. And that and that Bob was really helpful to Derek and gave him a wee foot up. So Derek is uh, your sort of guy who, oh, you, you, you wouldn't fancy your chances in a, in a, a Scottish, English, German world football quiz against Derek. Derek mm-hmm. would be your man. Uh, but frankly, that's no me. Scottish football. And I think what it is as well, guys. Because I've always tried to make anything I say or anything I've written about Scottish football as light-hearted as possible, I need to know the minutiae of Scottish football. I need to know about the the dinner lady at Alloa who's getting pumped by the reserve goalkeeper. <laughs> you know, rather than rather than who's won La Liga. You know, I, I couldn't give a shit. You know, it's the stuff that you can get a laugh with that will always interest me. So, because of that, I have... I have definitely, there is no doubt about that, that I have switched off with football out with Scotland to focus on uh, our own game and everything that it involves. Superb. I mean, we've been told not to get our hopes up, but you must be like, buzzing at the, the, the prospect in August first return, just, just even so slightly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the only thing that I'm, you know, I, I keep saying the, the old... Uh, uh, line that Jock Stein came out with years ago that there's no football without fans. I tend to agree with that. The thought of Motherwell back in action, playing closed doors, and me watching the game in a laptop, or if we're lucky, and that one's picked for the telly, watching it, sitting in the living room. <sighs> yeah, I'll, I'll watch it. Of course I'll watch it. It's my team that's Scottish fit, as I say, but um, I'm just really waiting on that vaccine and waiting on the day when we can get back to Firth Park um, or even and that's where we might not win as many trophies as Celtic and Rangers but one of the great things is oh, it will be a hell of a lot easier for us to socially distance uh, you know the first step back after closed doors it will be easier for us to socially distance I actually feel a lot of sympathy Celtic and Rangers fans who immediately buy up they snap up their season tickets but as we were talking about last week in the show, Celtic have got 60,000 season ticket holders, Rangers 52,000, whatever it is. They're not going to be allowed that number inside the stadium uh, when fans are allowed back in. So these fans face, you know, the, 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 the fear it will be of a ballot. It will be like the fans normally for European games, uh, particularly away trips in Europe where it's almost like names in a hat. Um, or only one supporters bus gets five tickets, maybe, and it's a lucky to draw at Motherwell or any of the so-called We Diddy teams. You know, I think, and I think the capacity at Fir Park, I think, is a wee bit either end of fourteen thousand. So let's say that if it was one of the seventy percent of your games, let's say it was Motherwell against St Mirren. I'll use that as an example. Motherwell against St Mirren, I guess the crowd in recent years has been five and a half thousand. So I'm guessing that would be a third there or thereabouts of capacity. I'm guessing we could socially distance uh, a five and a half thousand crowd if we thought about it. Or maybe a push, maybe get it down to four thousand. Uh, so that could be great. I could, I could get back there. I wouldn't be sitting maybe directly back with my pals. We would maybe be, you know, four or five seats between us all. Uh, a gap. I would accept that, but. I'm really, really fantasising about A, getting the game back on August the 1st, B, the next stage, getting some fans into the stadium, and then ultimately uh, the vaccine and every day able to get in there. Shake hands with your pal that you've not been able to shake hands with for however long it'll end up being, a year or whatever, you know. So I, I can't wait for that day. Yeah, I think we're on the same boat. But Tom, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on, mate. No problem, boys. I've got to get back in a wee bit of prep. I don't know when you put this out, but just to 
keep it real and keep it live for the listener. It is five past four now on Saturday. So what I do next, I'll, get into the, I'll go back into the BBC, the printed off Terrace and Teaser answers. Somebody a chance to win a mug, they'll be on my desk. So I'll have a wee, uh, get a highlighter pen out and get through the best of those. And uh, then we're back on air at five o'clock. And tonight, me, Stuart, and one of Stuart's heroes, Stephen Anderson, the Saints legend, a goal scorer in the Scottish Cup victory. And uh, I think 441 appearances for Saints. Uh, so we've got him on tonight. So I better go and get myself ready, boys. Okay. Good one, Good one. 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 Good one.